All right, thanks, Mark. Um, I don't know whether we'll, uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll see how the projector goes. Um, so I'm going to be switching back between the, the talk and then some demos and stuff like that. Um, so bear with me if there's a problem. Um, all right, so who am I? Uh, Mark basically said I do a bunch of penetration testing with Sonera. Um, you know, this is, you know, application, web, external, network, you know, whatever. Whatever it is, we can do it sort of thing. Um, I used to do a lot of development and uh, security research with a large uh, web security vendor. They don't need my advertising anymore. Um, and I also um, worked at GT for a while doing random stuff. Um, so I've got kind of experience all over the map. Uh, but really, I've been really interested in, in JavaScript recently, and mainly because of how, uh, uh, how, it's, how it's changing the way that we're using the web. Um, and we've kind of seen this trend kind of happening for a really long time. And uh, we always see the same problems. I mean, it, as with anything with security, you're always seeing the same problems over and over again. But it's kind of interesting to look at the new technologies and kind of look at any kind of new potential attacks that you might have. Um, so. I know we have kind of a smaller group here, so I want to get an idea of who is familiar with like HTML5 web sockets and you like do it every day, or how much time should I spend on the tech review? So show of hands, HTML5 that I use in my back pocket all the time. Um, all right, so I'll spend a little bit of time on the tech review um, and just kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about here and why it's interesting. Um, okay, so what is reactive JavaScript? Uh, I mean, no one really, I, I kind of call it reactive JavaScript because it's a lot of different components that turn it into something that's reactive, right? When you think of something like Facebook or Gmail, all of that's a whole bunch of JavaScript that communicates with the back end that does a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so, so back in the day, we had uh, like XML HTTP requests, like 1996, like Internet Explorer added this because they didn't want to have ActiveX anymore and they wanted it to be supported. Um, but reactive JavaScript is this idea of using a single web app, a single web page, like a single HTML blob that does everything, right? So you download the whole application and it just works. Um, so basically all the JavaScript is loaded in the back end. There's a whole bunch of communication that goes on. Uh, that can happen either via WebSockets, which is the new HTML5 method, or it can be like uh, long pulling HTTP requests or something like that. Basically you need to get a whole bunch of data from the back end to, 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 single, to serve your single page, right? The whole idea with reactive JavaScript is that you've got everything. You go and get only the data you want, but you leave all the UI there, right? So you're not spending time going to get UI every time. If you think about like a single web application, or if you think about old school web applications, right? You type in a URL and it goes and fetches all of the HTML for every single page, right? So you're clicking on links, your browser's like, all right, let me go get all this stuff. But really all that's changing is the content, right? And so if you had a way to get that data back up to the front into the UI without having to go and fetch every single part of the markup again, you can save a whole lot of time, right? And so um, that's that whole J JavaScript to an API kind of communication layer. And really, you know, this is being done for um, a lot of reasons, and, and there's a lot of reasons that, that uh, WebSockets and, and things like that are trying to, are, are breeding this type of technology. And really, um, when HTML5 came out, all the browsers started supporting it, like Chrome and, and WebKit really pushed this. Uh, you know, we started seeing a whole lot more communication over WebSockets. And I stole this presentation slide, and you can't really see it um, very well, but basically the idea is that with AJAX requests, with H XML HTTP requests, you, you pull the server, you send to the server, and you can do that maybe like every 20, 30 milliseconds or something like that. And for a long time, people were like, hey, I really want to be able to send a whole lot of data, like a TCP connection, but it's like, oh, well, there's security and there's all these other problems. We can't have a TCP connection from a web client because that's just not what we designed this to do. So WebSockets basically said, okay, screw it. We're going to figure this out. We are going to make a TCP connection for an HTTP application because we need this, right? And so it's like driven by commercial stuff where you know, we've got like Gmail that's like, guys, <laughs> I just want to send emails. I want to check the server. Do I have another email? I don't want to have to refresh the whole page to check if I get another email. And then you had like Google Wave, which you know, is, is historical at this point, right? Um, but basically, they just wanted to sit there and say, I want to have like a whole bunch of different streams open. I want to have like you know, 90 emails over here and over here, and I want to have like millions of people updating stuff, right? And so they were doing this all via Comet, which is this whole long, which is this uh, 
long polling method of AJAX where you just basically initiate a request whether you want data or not and you just wait. And then the server says, oh, I got data. And so basically it's like this hack on HTTP that says like, okay, I'm just gonna make this connection and wait until there's data. And I'll just believe that the proxies are gonna hold it open and all this stuff. And, and for a long time, that's how uh, Gmail and, and Google Wave actually worked, was they just made a connection and then waited for the response, like, oh my god, the server's so slow. But really, it's the server hacking on this connection to send back data. Um, jQuery and, and then JavaScript optimizations also made a really big uh, impact on being able to do these single-page web apps. Um, so where are we going, right? Where, why, um, why is this talk going to be interesting? Why is this stuff going to be interesting? Really, um, we had this idea of WebSockets coming out. You know, it's the low latency communication. You can open up a connect. You can open up a connection, send data back and forth, small packets, big packets, whatever you want. Uh, it holds open that TCP connection. Um, really, it's all about acting more like a desktop app, right? And and being able to fight with uh, mobile apps and things like that, because on the mobile side, your phone has limited bandwidth, right? So if you can load all of your UI up front, and then work on just sending data back and forth, your, your, uh, your experience is much more, uh, there, there's, it's a lot faster, right? Because you get, you're just sending data, you're not sending all of the UI components. Um, and so be, because of all this, you know, there's tons of frameworks now that have, like, you know, jQuery was like one of the uh, first ones to try to pull all the XML HTTP requests into a single blob and then also DOM manipulation and stuff like that. But really, there's also a push for event-based event server architecture, and, and Node.js was one of the first ones that was like, all of this threading stuff that you guys are doing is insane. You're spending all this memory on holding open threads across every single connection that's open. I just want to be able to send back and forth data and then you know, go to the disk and get it whenever I need it, and not worry about having to open a thread for every single connection, because Apache for example, would do this, right? And it's done this forever. And that has a single thread, and it takes like 10 megs for that Apache process to be held open. So if you're doing long polling comet connections, Apache's holding open this 10 meg thread in your, in your uh, server, just sitting, all right, I'm just gonna wait for the database to say I've got a new connection, I'm gonna send some data to it. Uh, but it means while you're on your server, you're just sitting there with 10 megs and you're just wasting it away and, you know, whatever. Uh, but with event-based node style connections, um, you're just basically saying, okay, well, I don't need a thread anymore. I'm gonna do it all on this single thread or multi-threaded or whatever, and all, all, only thing I need to keep around is a connection data, so just a few KB. Um, okay, so, you know, where's this all going? You know, it, you know, who knows where it's actually gonna go, but I've, there's a couple of frameworks these days that are saying that the browser DOM is too slow, and they're gonna use HTML5 to render all of the web page inside of a canvas because it's faster to actually run stuff in JavaScript than it is to use the browser DOM. And so, <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, the other thing to consider with WebSockets is because it's no longer a very well-structured data flow, it's basically binary data. It's kind of like we're going back toward the dark ages of communication with web applications, right? And so web applications are still gonna want folks to be able to crawl and index them. But if you think about, um, the way WebSockets work, it, it could be a binary protocol, it could be an arbitrary protocol, uh, and we'll see some interesting arbitrary protocols here where data is being exchanged, but HTTP is very regular, and that allowed Google to crawl web applications and index them, and the web application archive to go out, and, or the, the internet archive to go out and pull data down and save it. Um, but we're moving away from that with doing WebSockets because all of the data is gonna start going over WebSockets and indexing is gonna be requiring understanding each application and their data streams and you know how do you get into this and it also adds some interesting stuff for security because it's a very difficult problem to handle proprietary formats, right? Because with HTTP, it's not this proprietary format. Everything does HTTP. But while WebSockets is, 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 a, is a standard, all the data is not. So some things to consider where, where this is going. Um, so just some more background on WebSockets. You know, how do we actually set the, one of these up? Um, so I don't know if you guys in the back can see, but I'm just gonna keep talking about it. Uh, basically the way that WebSockets works is you start initiating a connection and you send a HTTP 101 request, which is an upgrade. And that says to the, in the, all the middle layers, that says to the proxies in the, in the way saying, okay, I'm gonna set up a WebSocket. Anyone that doesn't understand a 101 request needs to return a 500 to me. 
and or not a 500, but they need to return saying, I don't know what this is, you need to go away. And then you'll start doing long polling or something like that. But basically, it's, this is, it's all, all this WebSocket stuff is being done over HTTP. So if you were to look at the HTTP stream in like Wireshark or something like that, you would see the HTTP 101 request and then the connection would just never close. It would just stay open and the client and server are sending stuff back and forth. It's sort of like how you do a connect request over a proxy um, when you want to do like a SSL connection over an HTTP proxy, you issue, you issue a connect request and then all of a sudden you have a bi-directional TCP connection. Um, but they went with a, a separate protocol just to be distinct from that sort of thing. Um, uh, this is also a bit small over here. I can barely read it up here, so I'm not going to expect you to. But this is just a sample protocol and we'll talk about it. Um, so typically, right now, we're seeing WebSockets that aren't necessarily binary, but there's no reason they couldn't be binary. Uh, there is actually a fair amount that are basically just JSON, where you're sending JSON back and forth, and it's just relying on the back end to eval, or the, the, the browser to basically eval this contents into its DOM and just immediately occur, or within its, within its uh, object model. Okay, so. Uh, so how does this change the attack surface for a web application, right? And so not just WebSockets, but the whole reactive way of thinking, right? And so you have basically the application code for all users and all privileges, all right? So let's just think of a sample like WordPress, right? If WordPress was a single web application, the admin section, the, the posts, all of the plugins, all of that sort of stuff that's usually sitting on the server that's PHP code is now being sent down to the client because the client is doing everything, right? So the client has basically all of the UI interaction that a user is going to do being sent down in JavaScript. Now there's ways to limit what's being sent down, uh, but you know when you're designing something to be quick and, you, and things like this, you're pushing all that code down. And so you got to think about the impact of that, right? Because traditionally the admin section has been uh, like segmented off from like the unprivileged section. And so when you start merging these uh, high privilege and low privilege sections together, you get interesting uh, things that can be enumerated and things that can be identified by attackers. Uh, because you know, th there's actually a lot of situations where there's, well, I can tell you for sure <laughs> that there's tons of commercial products that have admin sections that have tons of vulnerabilities but their, their public section has been vetted or their public section has been, has been analyzed, whereas the admin section has been not analyzed at all and there's you know, basically just riddled with vulnerabilities. Um, so the other thing that's, that's changing significantly is moving the data to more of an API design where instead of going and getting an entire HTML page that's already pre-rendered that has all of the data that that page needs, there's now an API where it's basically a, a query to the endpoint server saying, hey, I need the user profile for this user, right? And so there's a lot of interesting uh, well, it's, it's not this is interesting, it's just that it's nuanced in the way that you request this, right? And so in the past, you just said, give me this page, the server controls all the data, says, okay, that's cool. You know, there might be a layer saying, let me just make sure that this is that server, or this is for that user. And so what we're seeing with the data APIs that are for these single page web apps is that it's designed to be, well, it's designed to work, right? And that's the typical problem with security in general is that designed to work doesn't necessarily mean designed to be secure. Right? Um, so can you request other user profiles, things like that? Um, <laughs> so so the, also these are real-time protocols. The, the web sockets are, are basically occurring at as fast as you can with your TCP connection, right? Um, the, I don't know if you guys saw, but there was a recent example of the, the Starbucks gift card that went out and the guy was uh, sending multiple uh, transfer requests at the exact same time and basically ended up with a gift card that was worth $15 instead of $5 because he tried to transfer multiple cards to the same card at the same time and ended up in a race condition on the database where he updated the card before it uh, you know, reversed back and removed the, the value from the card. So he actually uh, he doubled his value of his gift card. And so you're going to see race conditions like that, especially with a data API that doesn't have a, a separate web application controlling the interaction with the data side, right? So now we're exposing the web server and the data side to the client. And, and we've seen this with Ajax before. I mean, this is, this is nothing new. We've talked about this in 2006 where we're like, oh my goodness, if people are making Ajax web applications. They're going to start putting the data API outside of the, the 
the server and people are going to communicate. It's going to be the end of the world. Um, and so it's not really the end of the world, right? Because people know what they're doing in, in most situations, but there's these unintended side effects. Um, and so, you know, it just, just, just a reminder that, you know, while some of the attacks may be a different incarnation, it's really the, something we've been talking about in the web security community since like 2006. Um, and, and reactive pages are really just this, the complete fruition of moving all of the user interactive code to the browser instead of leaving it on the server and doing the processing there. All right, so where does that leave our traditional security defenses in the face of this reactive world where we have a WebSocket TCP connection? Um, Unfortunately, not great. Uh, traditional WAFs are designed to parse HTTP requests and figure out what are the important components. But when you start throwing WebSockets at a traditional web application firewall, it's off, right? There's no, all of the regexes are totally worthless for analyzing for attacks. All of the rules that it have for, has for parsing the sort of stuff pretty much totally worthless. Um, Whenever you have an arbitrary protocol, it's really difficult. I mean, Snort has had a problem with this since they started. They're like, oh my god, every single time there's a new protocol, I've got to write a new analyzer for it. And just imagine if every single web application had a different protocol that you now have to analyze and figure out whether that's a real attack or not, right? And so one of the problems with WebSockets is because it's arbitrary, the same reason that I called it you know, the dark data web kind of thing, is it, it's going to be this custom protocol and, and the more real time that we're seeing web applications, the more custom this protocol is going to be because they're going to start compressing that data. And I'll, I'll show you an example of that. There's a, a, um, an application called uh, Shooter, which was made by .NET, which is actually, uh, they've already gone ahead and said, we need to make this faster. And they've done a like JavaScript minification on the WebSocket communication that they're doing. So it's still JSON, but they've basically run, run a Huffman encoding on it so that now you can't tell what the heck it's doing unless you decode it. Um, so, you know, it, all, of the, all of the web assessment tools and stuff like that based on the HTTP request and response model, um, when you're doing scans on your web applications, uh, reactive JavaScript, you're just going to totally mess that up because the way that the scanners deal with this sort of thing is they just take a, a, like a spider monkey or something like that and they're like, okay, let's see what all the events are on this page and just start randomly clicking like crazy. I mean, that's all the web applications do, scanners do. And so when you have like a, a reactive web application where there's just tons and tons of uh, endpoint APIs and interactions between data, you know, all, if you just start spamming random events or just running random functions within the JavaScript object model, <laughs> Who knows what you're actually doing, right? You could get into a state that doesn't even exist. Um, so, you know, like I said before, it's really just the actualization of what Web 2.0 actually was supposed to be, where they're, you know, moving all the JavaScript down to the client and, and uh, not having to communicate back and forth between the server as much as possible. Um, so, so here's the technology that's broadly used today. Uh, we have like Socket.io, Node.js, and, and Meteor. Um, we have Signaler and Angular uh, JS from .NET and Microsoft and a few other folks. Um, and then Facebook has Flux and Dispatcher. Basically all these are the same thing. They are the technology stack that enables the server to send events to the client and the client to act on them. Right? And so that uses WebSockets, that uses uh, fallback mechanisms potentially. That also includes a messaging queue at the server side and a messaging queue at the client side to make sure there's consistency and all sorts of stuff like that. So these are pretty complicated frameworks. I mean, these are, these are intense pieces of software. Um, Microsoft also has a pretty awesome thing that's been used in a lot in the mobile side. That's the, the .NET OData and Web API. And um, basically, they wanted they, they created this because they wanted to bind a database straight to the API. They wanted someone to be able to, be able to create a database schema and then have a REST request to the database and not have to worry about SQL injection and not have to worry about all these things. And so basically, they just wanted to solve the, okay, people have been messing up SQL injection for the whole ever since it started, right? Ever since we put a database behind a web application, let's just get rid of that and let's do OData instead. So let's have this, let's create stored procedures between <laughs> the communication of the web application and, and the database. And so that's what OData is. And we're gonna talk about all of these and kind of some attacks related to them depending on how much time we have here. Um, but I'd be happy to talk about anything further if anyone has any specific concerns about stuff. Um, 
let's not worry about that. Okay, so what's the history of this and where, where are we actually coming from? And so .NET view state, I'm sure all of you have run into view state at some point. View state is this horrible blob that's sent back and forth in post requests from .NET web applications that is an attempt to keep the state of the server on the client. So the server doesn't have to remember what's going on but the client does that for it. And the way it does that is it pushes this massive encrypted and, and Mac blob to the server and says, here's my state of my web application. <laughs> Perform your one request on it and, and, and send it back because I don't want to have to remember what your current state is. Um, and so now we're, we're seeing that, okay, well, <laughs> let's not do that necessarily. Let's just let the client do absolutely everything. And then we'll create this data API where it can communicate with it, and maybe or maybe not we'll have some ECLs on it. We'll see. Um, you know, Java Struts also did some interesting stuff with variable binding and keeping state on the server and state on the client. So whenever you change something on the server uh, database side, there's a bound variable, and it would send a message back to the web API or the web application. It would it would update it. Um, and then there's a bunch of other examples where there's uh, approaches to, at doing this and, and separating out uh, data and um, the way the data is rendered and the way the UI is rendered and based on the, the path that you're taking through the application. Um, so, that, you know, that this is the history of, of where, we, where we were coming from. Um, and so what's the goal of the, those frameworks? What's the goal of Meteor? What's the game of, uh, goal of Flux and, and Signaler? And that's really to provide every single one of these steps along the way, right? There's client-server event generation, so you either have a client that's somewhere down here doing something, or the server produces something, you get a new email or something like that, that generates the event. There's now a transport, which is, you know, WebSockets probably, or maybe it's, it's actually on the server side where it needs to go to a database or something like that. There's some publish subscribe messaging layer. Um, that's like RabbitMQ uh, or something like that that has to sit in the intermediary layer and do the communication. And then there's consistency tracking on the server side and the client side. The client needs to know if it doesn't get a response back from a method call or the server needs to know if there's now a collision with data and needs to figure out all these consistency problems. And so there's a lot of logic in there that can be abused. Um, and then there's also the IO layer, which is the WebSockets between the clients or you know, a, a Comet connection or something like that, Ajax. And then there's the rendering on the client where that's you know, something like Angular or whether that's something like uh, handlebars or spacebars within Meteor. And, and that's all being worked on the, the data layer. And so that's what React, this is, this is Reactive JS right here, right? This is, there's, there's a lot of components that are not JavaScript in this. Um, but it's really the idea of all of this put together and then running JavaScript on the client enables uh, fast, fast communication and, uh, and fast rendering and, and, and just moving the, the web applications much more toward what a desktop application is going to be like. All right, so Meteor has this idea of publish and subscribe. Um, how many of you guys have used Meteor application or seen a Meteor application, used a Meteor application? You probably have and you just don't know it. Because um, those are starting, I'm starting to see Meteor applications everywhere in one way or another. Um, and so there's a whole idea of being published and subscribed. So you, you publish data saying, okay, you're going to join this stream of you know, Matt's email. And you, I'm going to subscribe to this and the server has to publish Matt's email and I subscribe to Matt's email. And I can, I can provide an, a key or whatever it is. Uh, but it, rely on, it relies on, on MongoDB. Uh, which is this JavaScript based uh, database that enables, you know, you, you basically don't have to write a schema, it just works based on JSON. Um, and so, you know, Meteor, Meteor is this idea that we don't want to have anyone deal with the server side stuff. This is going to be this entire stack that, we, that I saw earlier. Meteor implements this whole stack, and all you need to worry about is writing the UI and writing the database communication. Um, there's, there's some URI handling rules that are interesting, and, and we'll look at some uh, attacks related to that. Um, but basically, you know, uh, taking a look at, at the messaging protocols with, with Meteor, there's this whole idea of publish and subscribe, right? And so this is what a WebSocket communication looks like from a subscribe from a Meteor application. So you basically say, hey, I've got a message. I need to subscribe to... Um, I need to subscribe to this, this event called uh, Meteor Auto Update Client Versions. And basically, this is a way to, this is part of that synchronization, right? Because if the server side code change, changes, the client needs to know that it needs to re download everything. Um, 
And so this is one of those just sub subscription events. And so then you have server, or then you have servers sending stuff saying, okay, cool, you've now connected to the uh, the, the the subscription, and we'll, and we'll you can you can start downloading data or the data actually the data is already downloaded and you're ready to go. And there's also the you know subscribing to a specific collection things like that where there's there's changes to that your your local. Um, your local database. And so one thing I didn't mention was this whole mini Mongo thing. It's basically an implementation of the Mongo database on the client. And so it enables the client to basically have the entire, uh, their view of the database on their system. And that allows really, that allows that quick updating and stuff like that. And, and so that's, that's the idea behind that. Okay, so how do you actually do any security testing of these Meteor applications that are pushing data down via subscriptions and publishes over WebSockets, right? Um, you know, there's really no tool out there at the moment that even deals with it, right? There's, there's no, you, you can't go and even buy something that will help you do this. Um, because automated, because of the way that the communication occurs, the way that the updating occurs, and, um, and so if you're, if you're publishing Meteor applications, you're, you're stuck with just, you know, looking at it manually and stuff like that at the moment. We'll, we'll see how that happens in the future. Um, you know, there, there might be some tools that come out. Um, so there, it's, you know, it's really difficult to identify spurious data as well. You know, whenever you see, um, when I say spurious there, I'm looking, you know, it, it could be spurious, it also could be an attack, right? Because how do you tell the difference between someone sending data over a WebSocket connection versus a, a client versus a server versus an attack and, and things like that? Um, Meteor applications also typically expose the server code. Uh, this is interesting because it's all written in Node.js. So there are ways to hide the server code in, in Node.js, but typically with a Meteor application, there's just an if statement that says, if I'm on the server, run this. But all of the JavaScript is actually pushed down to the client. All of the server-side code, all of the client-side code, all of it is pushed down to the client. Um, they have tried to remediate this in some way by creating different server folders and things like that. Um, but ultimately, you're, you're going to get a lot of uh, logic from the server as well as from the client uh, just by the way that it pushes all that data down. Um, so, you know, just elaborating more on what the, the challenges are with testing. Um, there's, there's been a lot of discussion with Ajax and how do you how do you test a specific flow within the UI, right? Do you reset the DOM in between or do you, you know, things like that. Um, okay, so what are the common issues with Meteor? Um, I, I, I kind of hate the, the OWASP top 10 insecure direct object reference. I kind of hate that, but it also describes so many different things. Um, and so really there's a reliance on client-side filtering with Meteor uh, and with ReactiveJS in general because you're relying on the client to, to validate that this is a good value. Um, Object updating, deleting on subscriptions, removing and pushing data. I mean, that's a problem. Uh, insecure router data configurations. So there's, you know, when you have a, a single page web app, there's no idea of it. There's no real different page, right? It's all a single HTML page. But there's this idea of a router within Meteor where it looks at hashtags or it looks at the URI and renders different things and the server may do different things based on that. Um, and you can actually usually see all of that code in the, in the source code. And so we'll take a look at some of that. Um, and then there's also JSON object injection into the Meteor methods. And so there, there are methods that can be exposed in Meteor that will actually, um, because it's a Mongo backend and it all operates on JSON, you can actually pass JSON objects into these if they're not properly secured. And you can do interesting things like, well, I'll show you in a little bit here. Um, and another very common thing uh, is, you know, it, is you know privileged API exposure that shouldn't be there. The whole admin versus non-admin challenge uh, when you're pushing all of the data down, um, and then you know the the constant problem of authentication versus versus authorization, or really are the data APIs at all? Um, and so one of those one of the first examples that I wanted to show you um, was this because we're doing this whole healthcare theme sort of stuff. Was there is a demo application that someone had published on Meteor. And so, in a traditional application, whenever you went to the user section of a website, let's see if we're still on the internet. Oh.
So traditionally, whenever you hit like a, an authenticated section of a web application, you would anticipate that you know, the server does some logic, figures out whether you're logged in or not, and then renders the page. But in a single page web app, what you actually will see is that the whole web page will download, it will then try to decide whether it can communicate with the data APIs or not, and then it will actually figure out, okay, now I can go get the data or now I can't. And so there's this interesting control flow branching that occurs um, basically when, when you're not able to log in or you're not able to reach a page that you just basically guessed, right? Because there's a traditional problem in web applications where you're able to guess URIs and you may get lucky, right? So that's the whole idea behind directory brute forcing on web applications is that you're able to create data that wasn't properly secured and or you're able to find pages that weren't properly secured um, and then be able to access them. And so, okay, so, so we're now, I requested the user page, and you'll notice that it's shot at me back to the sign-in page. Uh, but this is a single web, uh, single web application, right, where you know, the URI may have actually caused my browser to make a request, but all of the data is still there. And this is what you would have expected from a normal web application. But because I actually requested that user page first, when I take a look, at, when I go into the JavaScript console here, which is always a fun place to be, um, actually, let's just do this from the, so I'm going to take a look at the WebSocket communication and I'm going to request that user's URI again. So now we have our WebSocket and we've sent a whole bunch of data. I'm going to zoom in here. You guys can't see this. Is that more visible? You guys can see that in the back? Yeah, okay. Um, it's a bit small still. Anyway, you can see that there's this collection that's being added here called users. Um, and it, it makes, you, makes you wonder why I'm seeing a collection called users. And so if we take a look at the actual contents of this, if I can spell it correctly. We can see that in this, uh, let me increase the font here. Can I just zoom in? No. You guys can see that. So we see this in this user collection. I now requested the user's URI. On the back end, the router said, okay, cool, he's part of the user's URI. He's doing this. I need to send this data before I can respond. And so what happened was I've now got all of the users in this web application because it basically just published the entire user's database because part of, that authentic, or part of that page required me to have all of the users. And so before I even signed in, it now sent me this you know, bcrypt hash from, from the Meteor Mongo database. And so this is this person's password that signed into this demo application. Obviously, it's, it's all fake, um, hopefully. Uh, but but you know, it basically, because there was, no, there was a failure in this router validation that I was supposed to be at that page, it now sent me all the data. And so to take a look at uh, what's actually going on there, let's take a look at the source code. That's the page that I was looking at. I had it up. All right, well, let's not worry about that. I'll just keep moving. Um, so basically, that was a publish that shouldn't have occurred because I requested a specific URI. The server said, OK, I need to publish this data collection for this person to work on this page. But then, as part of that, that control flow, it said, wait a minute, wait a minute, he's not logged in, but he already pu they already published the data, I was already logged, or I was already accessing the data, but then it realized I didn't log in correctly, and then it redirected me back off. But, you know, what do you do at that point, right? So there's this order of operations that's really important when you're dealing with this kind of data. Um, another example is this uh, telescope app. So basically, on these URIs that have users and, and Telescope was actually a funny one because I was basically just reviewing. I'm not starting Chrome, that's a good one. No, that's because we lost the internet again. That's good. So, so basically, Telescope's an interesting one in that they publish a specific method when you get to a specific URI, this user's URI, and th that method is only published when the URI, when you're at the URI. Um, and so you can use this method to do things 
interesting things that I'll show you when I get this the internet back up here. But I'm going to move on until then. Come on, little guy. Oh yeah, it's good. Oh, we're just going to stare at my computer for a minute. lesson on Linux. So what happens when your display manager dies? All right, that's how you get it back. All right, so we just did that one. Um, this is the source code that's associated with it. I don't know if you guys can see that in the back there, but basically there's this router.map function that goes and gets a user profile related to it. And it says, okay, here's the user ID path. This is what you're required to request to get to it. And now there's this wait on function part of the router that says, okay, before I render this page, I wanna make sure I subscribe to this user's directory. And basically, all of this is, is, is not rendered until uh, this, this, is, this succeeds. And so there's this on before action where they could have set some login logic to prevent this from occurring, uh, but, but it basically it's not there. Um, there's this other idea in Meteor where you can, you can inject data directly into the Meteor uh, queries. And so this is what a, a Mongo query looks like in general. It's basically this JSON blob that says, okay, I want to do or first name, and then I want it to be start with a G, and I also want it to have, or, or I want it to have a, a birth date equal to this, right? And so over here, there's an example of, of the uh, telescope app where they publish this specific web, app, web method called single user, and then they look for a user ID or a, a unique identifier. And so they pass it directly into the users on the, uh, they pass it directly into the users, uh, you know, um, uh, database and say, okay, I need to make this request. And if you put this kind of structure inside of this kind of parameter, you're now passing a meteor object directly into the Mongo database. And so you can do interesting things like, you know, when you call this method, um, you can specify a special type of AND query to identify whether or not you're even getting into that type of injection situation. And um, then you can do things like enumerate users where, okay, well, now I've seen an error related to this sort of stuff. I now can see a username that is related to, you know, it starts with TE, right? So if there was a test, I would actually see this, this user called test start to be enumerated. And then you can enumerate private uh, things that have to do with, you know, fields that may not be revealed. And so you're actually able to enumerate uh, hidden fields this way, hidden values this way via just making these like more complicated requests. Even if you don't see the data, you can still get responses, right? And so in this case, this is, this is all part of the, uh, there's a demo meteor application called tasks and you can go try all of this. Um, basically, if the task is private, the username is test and the text begins with a value greater than T, Right, and so now I can just start enumerating this greater than, less than, greater than, less than, and I can figure out exactly what the text is of this private value. And so even though I never actually get that data back, I can start sending these blind requests to this Mongo database saying greater than, less than, greater than, less than, and you can even make it a little bit better and start doing regular expressions saying, okay, you know, does it start with A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and which, which value is that in? How do you actually figure all that out based on regular And you can do a faster search using uh, regular expressions. Um, this was the example, and I'm not going to go into that. So... Just to finish up the Meteor stuff, what, what is, what, how do we do input validation? They, they provide values, they provide ways to do it, you just gotta do it, it's sort of like traditional. Um, make sure that publishes are reviewed, make sure all the server side code is whether it's exposed or whether it shouldn't be exposed. Um, use the latest version of Mongo, there are interesting uh, uh, integer overflows associated with some of these queries that you can do. Um, obviously, don't rely on web application firewalls for these sort of things. Uh, there are some problems related to that. 
Um, and then, you know, it, in future, in the future, we need to take a look at what you know .NET push, pushes out in terms of what the signaler and, and Meteor and how they're similar. Um, Microsoft does a much better job of making it difficult to write in secure code by making it more difficult to write the code. But you know, it, you got to take the good with the bad in that situation. So it's a different approach than, than Meteor has. Um, but I can obviously talk about more about these types of things with uh, offline. Um, I'm being told that I need to stop talking about this stuff. So I hope you guys uh, got something out of this. I hope that you've enjoyed it. Um, happy to answer any questions offline, and uh, thank you very much.